This is so many dead crows. What could have possibly done this? Perfect. Before this video really starts, we need to get this out of the way now, because I know it's going to be my most controversial take about this game, and I would rather people be upset by it now and just leave a few minutes into the video so I'm not wasting their time. I don't think Lady Dimitrescu is attractive. First of all, I don't like vampires. All they do is sit in a castle and act smug. Ugh, so gauche. Have you ever met somebody in real life that says gauche and is also fun to talk to? Plus, she's too big. I like women that are 4 foot 11 and look like this. I mean, her daughters are kind of cute, but they don't really seem like they're socialized very well. Wipe that blood off your face. I can't be around a woman that has juice box vibes. Ask yourself a question. Would you date a woman that punches drywall? I'm resting my case on this one. Resident Evil 8, or Resident Evil Village, or REV, the eighth inning, as I've been calling it, is obviously good. What am I gonna do? Come in here and say the game that has been cold fusion meme fuel for the past two months is bad? No. But... There is a lot of cool stuff to talk about here in terms of how it works as a horror action hybrid and how it slammed together Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 7 into probably the most coherent vision of what a Resident Evil game should look and feel like since maybe Resident Evil 2. Or I guess maybe the Resident Evil 2 remake, but that wasn't very long ago, so I'm going to say the original Resident Evil 2 in bad faith to make my argument stronger. And you can't stop me because this is YouTube and there are no rules or standards. Since Resident Evil Village is basically Leon Goes to Bingo and Hoarders Louisiana hosted by Ethan Winters combined into the same game, it makes sense to do a little bit of a mini review of each of these two games to kind of get a baseline. Both Resident Evil 4 and 7 are interesting because both of them represent a massive change in direction for the franchise. Obviously, 4 was a masterpiece and kicked off a more action-oriented series and popularized the idea of quick-time events for the next 50 years, among other things. And also, yes, I know I'm playing this on a mouse and keyboard, I don't want to fucking hear it. I couldn't get the Steam version of the game to read any of my controllers. But the side effect of this is that the game was absolutely not designed for controls as accurate as a mouse, so it was very easy to have Mark Wahlberg accuracy for the entire game. Beyond being a more action-focused himbo simulator, Resident Evil 4 also introduced the idea of packing in a bunch of side objectives in minigames, like the target shooting the other target shooting, the treasure hunt collectathon, and possibly the best alternate game mode ever made, mercenaries. Also, there are some RPG mechanics in there with weapon upgrades, which kind of added a nice sense of progression that didn't really exist in the franchise before this. And of course, we can't forget everyone's favorite video game in PC. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> Resident Evil 7, on the other hand, is interesting in that it sort of symbolizes a massive shakeup to the series by deciding to go for a first-person perspective, but also symbolized a return to form by dropping the over-the-top action of 4, 5, and 6, and going back to a more resource-oriented survival horror experience. The challenge of Resident Evil 7 was converting the Resident Evil formula into first person, which the game does flawlessly. And I suppose that makes sense. You can put handgun ammo in a drawer and make a wacky escape room puzzle in first person just as easily as in third person, but for some reason my gibbon brain just didn't expect it to work as well as it does in practice. I have no problem saying that Resident Evil 7 is one of the strongest entries in the series. It has excellent villains, 
It introduces a fungal infection, which is new for the series and has all kinds of fun pseudo science fiction implications. And it gives you a nice mystery to hold on to. How he hand go back on. Also, the gameplay is good. I'm not going to sit here and dedicate like 20 minutes of video time to reviewing it, but I mean, come on. It's classic Resident Evil ammo hoarding and puzzling, punctuated by using everything you have left to fight a big boss. And there's also a Bruce Campbell tier chainsaw duel. Basically the exact thing you would expect from Resident Evil, but distilled down to its component parts perfectly. Okay, the mini reviews are out of the way, let's see how all of this was slammed together. Obviously, Village is in first person, so we can check that off the list, but it also has all of the absolute best parts of both 4 and 7. You've got many objectives. You've got a treasure hunt. You've got a large merchant, just like in Resident Evil 4, but you also have the first person horror sections and the resource management of 7. This is all capped off with a Resident Evil 4 style weapon and character progression that accelerates the horror into high impact action over the course of the game. You also have an incredible cast of villains and you get to find out how he hand go back on. It's a more genius, smooth, and masterclass combination of all of the mechanics of 4 and 7 than I could have possibly imagined. And Capcom is fucking on one right now. Between the Resident Evil revival, Monster Hunter being bigger than ever, and Devil May Cry 5, I think it's safe to say that Capcom is one of, if not the best developers in the game right now, at least at the high-end AAA level. More interesting than all of this, though, is how Resident Evil Village uses its hub-style level design to actually give you all three things you want out of a Resident Evil game in three different areas that can all operate on different rules because for all intents and purposes, they are different levels. And this is where the spoilers are going to start. I'm not going to give you a time to skip to, because honestly I think the rest of the video is just going to be pure spoilers, both on the level of game mechanics and story. If for some insane reason you still needed a review this long after release to tell you this game is worth buying, then I guess I'll tell you it's worth buying. And if you're part of the 95% of people who already played it, stick around. Castle Dimitrescu, the first area of the game, gives you the classic Resident Evil experience. You have keys and doors, you have puzzles, your resources are limited, and there's a big fuck-off lady following you around, like Nemesis or Mr. X. It makes sense that this would be the first area in the game, because like I said earlier, as Ethan's arsenal of weapons gets more and more wild, the game shifts into a more of an action-oriented experience, which would kind of defeat the purpose of the vibe the castle is trying to create. Next, you end up at Donna's Funhouse, which moves the game into a direction of more pure horror. You don't even get weapons for this entire encounter. We're in the amnesia zone once again, but the difference is Capcom actually knows how to make this sort of thing great. In my last video, which got a total of about 12 views, so you may have missed it, I said this. Humans have a simple monkey brain, and sometimes you just need to give them a nice puzzle to solve, like giving a rat a hard-boiled egg, or asking a YouTuber to form a healthy relationship with another human. In this part of Resident Evil Village, essentially what Capcom has done is taken the escape room section from Resident Evil 7 and extended it out into an entire fully developed area. And I'm not bored when I'm walking around the Donna dimension because I'm trying to solve the puzzle that the entire mansion represents. After settling your differences with a puppet, you end up in this area, which honestly is the weakest part of the game and doesn't really fit into the three archetypes I'm talking about. This area does give you a bunch of important story info though, so it's kind of a necessary cooldown for what is to come, and also gives you a chance to save up your resources for the absolute 
extravaganza that is the game's final area. The lead up to Heisenberg's factory comes next, and is genuinely a fucking incredible action sequence that I did not expect to see in this game. This area where you're fighting off a massive swarm of lichens is borderline doom tier, and you can tell that this arena specifically was heavily influenced by the design of Neo arena shooters like Doom Eternal. You've got the red explosive barrels, you've got the verticality, you've got the don't stop moving gameplay. Amazing. And then, moving into the factory itself, while it isn't nearly as intense as the fight in, the action sticks around in the form of Heisenberg's soldiers. So, to tie up everything that I just said, what we have here is resource hoarding puzzles and boss fights, pure defenseless horror, and Resident Evil 4 style over-the-top action. The three pieces of the Resident Evil formula slotted into one game through the use of the central village as a hub location. And these areas need to happen sequentially, which means the entire game is also paced out to allow what is basically three different genres of game to occur one after another, which is an extremely impressive feat. But the wildest part is that because Resident Evil 1 is the game that sort of made the idea of survival horror and horror games in general popular in the mainstream, this is also the three parts of the entire horror genre itself. It has something for everyone is sort of a meme phrase used in game reviews. But in this case, Resident Evil 8 literally does have something for everyone by intentional design and successfully showcases how all three of these styles of horror game are all fantastic when done correctly. It's almost like a love letter to the entire horror genre. We don't get any insane, surrealist meta-horror like we see from the indie scene in games like Lost in Vivo, but that's the only flaw here. Maybe the Fishman section should have just been Ethan getting poisoned by Moreau and just having an acid trip for two hours of gameplay or something. Of course, Mercenaries is also good. I mean, I don't know what to say here other than the arcade game design on display is fantastic. The fun thing about a game mode like this is, since it's just an extra, you don't really have to worry about it looking too gamey. You can just have a huge, colorful power-up, and an announcer yelling shit at you the whole time, and just go full tilt into not caring if the audience remembers they're looking at a video game. But to reel in my excitement a little bit, there are some problems I had with Resident Evil Village, but they're mostly tonal problems. The first one is that Lady D seems to have difficulty navigating her own house, has no peripheral vision, and literally cannot enter the room the Duke is in. In the Resident Evil remake, Mr. X can be outsmarted in the police station and can't enter certain rooms, but he's painted as a large, dumb killing machine and also doesn't literally have the deed to the fucking building he's in, which makes all of this a lot more understandable in-universe. Lady D is a fully functional human being fighting a defensive battle in familiar territory, and so are her daughters. So it doesn't really feel right that I can just scoot through their castle and murk the shit out of them one after another with no real problem. Why can't she go into the Duke's room? Why is the Duke even in here? How does this guy get around? I realize the reason for all of this is that you need to make a video game work, but it still feels odd. The second small tonal problem I had with the game is that the lichens are very primal and aggressive in how they act and move, and I have a hard time buying that if I was shooting at a werewolf, this is what the fight would look like. 
Obviously, this is what Resident Evil combat has always looked like, but when it's a zombie, or a person with their brain hollowed out by a parasite, I can believe they would be a little lethargic, whereas in 8, this guy is like a wild animal. I'm intuitively expecting him to move around like a wild animal, and when he doesn't, it feels weird. Of course, in the late game, when you can just mag dump into their chest and do a 360 no-scope, it feels a little bit more realistic and a little bit less awkward. So, we can kind of chalk this up to the game needing to have a progression arc. This is also a problem with some of the boss fights, mostly the Lady D boss fight where she just sort of lets you shoot her at point blank range and doesn't seem to have any sense of urgency about the situation at all. And again, I realize this is all in service of making a video game functional, so it's not really a big deal, just more of a gripe. If Ethan had just got his throat ripped out by the third werewolf he fought, we wouldn't really have much of a video game. And this kind of concludes my review of the game on a mechanical level, but next I want to address some of the major criticisms that I've seen of this game, because that isn't something I get to do very often in my reviews, and it's also fun to just be petty and argue with people about shit that isn't important sometimes. Like, whether or not the large woman is hot. Alright, let's get into the first complaint. The idea that Resident Evil 8 is just magic now, it's too over the top, and isn't hard sci-fi enough. Let's look at the more wild parts of Resident Evil 8 real fast, that stand out from the rest of the series, and the ones that I most commonly see this complaint reference. 1. The big bioweapon bosses have human intelligence, and their own motivations, and goals, which is less believable to something like the Tyrant that's basically a meat robot. 2. There is a huge Dungeons and Dragons fungal elder god under the village. 3. Heisenberg has Magneto powers. 4. He hand go back on. These are pretty much the only four discrepancies or additions to what Resident Evil has always been that are present in Village. Some people will whine about the daughters being a swarm of flies as being bad or unrealistic, but this isn't the first time Resident Evil has had a villain that is a composite of a swarm of something. Some people will also whine about Donna basically doing witchcraft in her mansion, but it's very clear by this final scene that something about Donna just makes you trip balls when you're around her, and hallucinations are a totally believable symptom you could get from being attacked by a bioweapon that is emitting some kind of spore or whatever. So let's get into the four that I laid out a second ago, starting with the bioweapon bosses being basically human. Resident Evil, at its core, is a game about evil pharmaceutical and bioengineering companies trying to make bioweapons for a whole variety of reasons. At first, it's just zombies and animals that are bigger than they should be, but it's clear by the end of Resident Evil 1, and by the entirety of Resident Evil 2, that this is only the early phases of the technology. It stands to reason that given enough time and given enough resources, the technology would get better and better and better until eventually you end up with something like Lady D who is a fully functional, self-aware being. Now, some of the more large-brained members of the audience that have already played the game are probably thinking, but Jacob, the villains in Resident Evil 8 aren't grown in a lab like Mr. X. They come from having the Kado parasite implanted into a human's body. And Miranda isn't really doing hard science, so much as she is using the power of the giant fungal superorganism under the village. And you would be correct, this also just makes my point better. In real life, there are countless examples of nature figuring out things millions of years ago that humans only replicated very recently. Reptiles, birds, small mammals, and insects all figured out how to fly way before us. Plants figured out solar panels before us, certain fish were able to use electricity before us. The natural world is very good at exploiting the laws of physics in its favor if it's given enough time. In the Resident Evil universe, 
If it's physically possible for William Birkin to become a big wet eyeball man, then I would suspect that some kind of naturally evolved organism would be using these physical properties to its own advantage. And the superorganism being fungal makes that make even more sense. The megamyocyte itself and the ideas behind it are actually based on real-life organisms that are thought to have properties similar to what could be called a superorganism. In hot tropical forests, like the rainforest of South America for example, there is a vast network of fungal mycelium that span the entirety of the forest underground and are capable of chemical communication between themselves and other species of plants in response to certain stimuli. It's extremely wild shit, and you probably wouldn't believe it was possible if it wasn't scientifically verified. This is what the mold in Resident Evil 7 and 8 is based on. Now, obviously because this is a video game, the mycelium has to have almost Lovecraft-like properties and is capable of storing genetic data so completely that it can clone a person with their entire consciousness intact, which is for sure some Hideo Kojima bullshit, but if the materialists are right, it could be physically possible to physically store a person's consciousness. And, since Ethan is technically a reconstructed mold man, since his adventure in the bayou, it makes complete sense that he hand go back on. Ethan isn't, and never really was, human. He's a reincarnated mold man clone. Also, we need to keep in mind that from a storytelling perspective, the stakes in these games kind of have to keep going up. We can't just have 35 Resident Evil games in a row where the only enemy is a zombie or a zombie who is also a dog. There needed to be some kind of major shakeup eventually, and self-aware mold people is as good of a shakeup as any. But yeah, Heisenberg's Magneto powers are kind of bullshit. Also, Miranda is shooting dark pyromancy at me like a Dark Souls boss. That's kind of weird. But at the end of the day, I like the direction the series is going in, and I think that some high-level bioweapons basically being humans is great for the storyline and great for making the writing a little bit more interesting, especially if they let you play as one, which they are definitely going to in the sequel. The next large complaint that I've seen is that Ethan is too much of a blank slate or too much of a boring, faceless protagonist. First of all, he has a face, and it's not hard to find. Second of all, have you never played a Resident Evil game? Most of the characters are boring. You just think they're developed and fleshed out because you have 87 games full of context to trick you into thinking they're deeper than they really are. Ethan isn't any better or worse than any major protagonist that came before him. This complaint reads to me as nostalgia goggles for sure. Of course, if you want to argue that the entire series is dumb and the writing sucks and nothing makes any sense, that's fine, and I would probably largely agree with you if we're going to analyze a video game franchise's literature, but if you're saying that Ethan is a bad character in context, I think you're just upset we weren't playing as an old fan favorite again, like Leon or Jill. The third and final bit of petty discourse I want to tackle is the argument that the game is too short. It is kind of short, clocking in at 10 hours for one playthrough, but like most Resident Evil games that came before it, Village is meant to be played way more than once. This game has an enormous amount of unlockable secret weapons, and things like infinite ammo unlocks, and all kinds of weird achievements and an entire system for gaining currency to buy unlockables that you essentially earn via replays. This is not a game designed to be played one time. This is also to say nothing of Mercenaries, which I'm sure adds on at least another 10 hours for people that enjoy the game mode. On top of the sheer amount of replayability on display here, there is also the fact that aside from a couple exceptions, like the extremely long Resident Evil 4 and the very much frowned upon Resident Evil 6, all of these games are short. 
Resident Evil 2 can be finished in two hours without speedrun strategies. You just think these games used to be long because when you were a kid, it took you five hours to figure out that a blue gem went into a blue hole. I guess that's the end of my list of hot takes. Feel free to post a retaliatory essay in the comments that I will never read. To wrap this up, Resident Evil Village is very, very good. It's an incredible entry to the series, it's a great send-off for Ethan as a character, and it's the ultimate synthesis of everything that the franchise has been up to this point. It's got survival resource management, it's got horror, and it's got the absurd action that we have all come to love and expect. I am very excited to play as Rose in the sequel. Do not fuck me on this, Capcom. If you want to see more videos like this one, consider subscribing. Leaving a like and a comment are also very helpful. And if you like my content, spread it around the internet so my biomass can continue to grow. In the description, I have links to both my Twitch, where I stream sometimes, and my Discord, where you can interact with other people that are also trying to increase their biomass. And finally, you should follow me on Twitter so you don't miss any important updates. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.